Our scripture reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke. We will read verses 28 through 33 of chapter 14. So uh, if you'll read, I'll read the even numbered, and if you'll join me on the odd number of verses. That's not the, that's not Luke 14. I guess, I have, that's a lot of slides. <laughs> All right. Let me read from the Word of God. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish? Or what king, going to, war, to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Would you meditate on that passage of scripture and I'll lead us in a prayer in just a moment. Lord, in this short passage of Scripture that our Lord first shared with the multitudes and uh, with us today through the written word, he speaks of being prepared and counting the cost. And Lord, we're to give up all to follow you. That is the cost of discipleship. But there's an aspect of stewardship in this passage, and that's what we're going to learn more about this morning. Lord, uh, we know that you own all things. You give them to us to use, but for your purposes, not ours. And Lord, as we have given the time that you've given us, we give that back to you this morning and in this moment. This time is dedicated for you. Help us to worship you as you've instructed us with all our heart and soul strength and mind in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Glad that you're all here. Glad for those of you that are joining us online as well. If you are visiting and even if you're not, all of the announcements should be in this bulletin. If you are visiting though, there's a little section in this bulletin if you'll just take a moment to fill that out and turn that in when we uh, worship our Lord through our tithes and offerings, that would be most helpful. We have a fish fry that's going on. They're in the process of beginning to cook all that now. So at the end of the service, we will all be going over there for a fellowship, a time of fellowship, and there'll be a meal. So I'll provide so please feel free to come on over. Golden Oaks is attending, um, it's the fall festival for, I think like Senior Saints, what's it say up there, LBA Annual Luncheon? Does it give something better? Senior Adult Festival, that's what it's called. And there are, we've hosted it for a number of years. This year we're not hosting it. It's a church just down the road that is going to be hosting it, Willow Ridge. And they have, uh, we had over 300 last year. They've capped it this year at 300. So if you would like to attend that, that's Thursday, November 9th. I think it starts around 10 or 1030. And they'll have a, I think there's going to be a, a kind of a concert. And then right afterwards will be uh, the barbecue is provided by Sheely's. And that'll be free, but you'll need to sign up in advance. So please let us know so we can turn the names in if you'd like to attend. Don't forget to pick up the shoe boxes. There's a few left in the lobby. You can also do that online. Or if you designate money for that, we can fill out the shoe boxes uh, for you. Uh, we're uh, we're going to ask that they all come back by November 12th, which will be Sunday. We'll have a prayer of dedication for them before they get moved on, on up the line. We have our fall festival next Sunday evening. So the couple things I need to cover about this Sunday evening and next Sunday evening. Let me talk about next Sunday evening fall festival. In fact, I won't talk about it. Al, can you share? Just give us an update of what's needed and how things are going. 
We are desperately in need of cars, so we would love to have you come out and provide your trunk. Candy will be provided for you. Just be out here, be ready to go by um, 445 so that we can have our prayer time. We're also in need of some more volunteers for the registration table, the prayer time, which is our last stop where you greet and meet and talk with the individuals who come out and you ask about their prayer needs and you have that time to pray with them for those needs. Um, we also need donations for our cakewalk, so any type of food like pastries, cupcakes, anything like that that we can give to them will be appreciated. You can start bringing that in to us on, on Wednesday. If you have any questions, you can see myself or Nancy and there's a sign-up sheet at the round table out here. We'd love to see you sign up because we're told in Matthew that the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Ask God to send us into the harvest to reap his field. This is our opportunity. All right. Thank you, Al. We have a water baptism scheduled for Sunday, November 12th. If you've not followed our Lord in Believer's Baptism, please see me after the service. Be happy to share with you about that. Our beach retreat, Living in Babylon. We did an introduction to that last Sunday. The sign-up forms, you can sign up online, or there are actually sign-up forms out in the lobby. This is what they look like, so please fill those out and join us in January. This after, all right, so after the service, we're going to all head over to the Family Life Center and have a meal. So let me tell you what happens afterwards. Some of us are meeting for the regular Sunday evening things that go on, and some of us aren't. Let me see if I've got this right. We're not going to have a Wednesday or Sunday... Here I go again. Sunday evening. We won't do Sunday evening for the adults or the children. But children's choir, youth choir, and the youth uh, meeting in the evening is going on. Is that clear to everybody? Or, no children's choir. Youth choir and the youth are meeting afterwards, 530, to do their regular thing. But children are not meeting and the adults are not meeting um, this evening. We will be spending the time over there, and then afterwards we'll be helping clean up. If you can stay and help kind of put some chairs up or grab your chair at least and put it on the rack, that would be great. It'll save us some time as we get to clean up, but uh, we're looking forward to the time of fellowship. I'm going to ask our um, ushers now to come forward to take this morning's tithes and offerings. And I will pray over that as they're coming up. Lord, I thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, as we are willing to worship you now through our tithes and offerings, it's a recognition once again that everything belongs to you. Anything that we have, you've given to us. We're simply stewards of it. You ask us to give back a small portion of what you've blessed us with, and we do that this morning out of obedience to your command. Help us as a church family to be wise stewards of those resources. Because, Lord, people need you. They need to know about Jesus and that he died on the cross for their sins and rose again. So, Lord, that's why we're here. Help us to be able to proclaim that message of love to our neighbors, our community, and through things like Operation Christmas Child through the uttermost parts of the world. So please bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen.
all stand with us and sing before the throne of God.
Thank you, choir. All right. Turn that on. Once again, I want to welcome you to our service this morning, whether you're here or joining us online. You honored that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. You'll need a Bible so that you can study along, so if you'll go ahead and get that now. Now the Bible teaches us that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So we're all going to face death, and then we're all going to be before the Lord. Now when we come to that point when God calls us home, do we need to pack a suitcase in order to be ready? Anybody have their suitcase ready just in case God calls them home? No? Why don't we need a suitcase? Because you can't take it with you. You've heard that, right? You can't take it with you. I've heard that. I think Jack Benny would beg to defer. And probably I just dated myself and probably most everybody just said Jack who? Okay, can anybody make me feel good and say, I, I heard of that guy before? Okay, a couple of you had. Okay, a couple of you had. But we all have something in common. We're wise for our years. You've heard that saying, but it actually comes from the Bible. Take a look at what this says. Paul writes Timothy, his young preacher's son, the one he's raised up in the ministry, and he says this, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain... We can carry nothing out. Job put it this way in the Old Testament, in chapter 1, verse 21 of Job. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. It was said of Alexander the Great, who conquered the known world at age 33, it said that he wept because there were no more worlds left to conquer. He gave these instructions. He said, when I die, no matter how gilded my casket is, I want you to put a hole on either side for my arms. And I want my arms extended out from my casket, my dead, cold hands. So that when they parade my casket through the streets, everyone will see that my hands are empty and I couldn't take it with me. Well, Alexander the Great couldn't take it with him and neither shall you. It is certain that we carry nothing out of this world. Now, it was a man who had heard that you can't take it with you. He said, but I, I can at least try. And so he put all of his money in a big jug with a handle on it, and he put it in the attic. He figured he was going to die at home in his own bedroom in the bed, so he put it, the jug kind of right above where his bed would be, and he figured on the way up to heaven he could just snatch that jug up and see if he could take it with him. Sure enough, he died. And after everybody had come and gone, the wife went up into the attic just to see if the jug was still there. And you know what? That jug was still there. She thought, well, maybe he should have put it in the basement. <laughs> now, folks, whether you put it in the attic or you put it in the basement, you're not going to take it with you. But that doesn't mean that there isn't something that you can take with you. You say, but Pastor Sean, I thought you just said you couldn't take it with you. And now you're saying you can take something with you? And I want to share with you this morning about the thought of leaving a legacy. A great missionary, a statesman by the name of Jim Elliott said this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. There are certain things that we cannot keep. And there are certain things that we cannot lose. Folks, that which you will carry is that which you have given away. This morning we're going to look at what the Bible says about stewardship and planning for the future. Now, I think this is now my 272nd, maybe 74th Sunday. And I think last time when I preached on giving, which was in the book of Haggai, that was the fourth time out of probably five to six hundred times I've taught here. Well, this is number five, but it's not on giving as in just tithing. This is t tithing is an aspect, a part of stewardship. 
So there's a whole principle of stewardship. And so we're going to talk about that and see what God says in his word about stewardship this morning. So we're going to look to see what the Bible says about stewardship and planning in the future. So we're going to ask you to turn to Luke chapter 16. And as you're finding that, it's a very interesting chapter with a very interesting parable in it about money and wealth and stewardship. It's said that the most sensitive nerve in the human body runs from the heart to the pocketbook. Now, all of us have something in common. We all, all have some interest in money. But you're not the only one that's interested in money. God's interested in your money. God's interested in how you secure your money, how you save your money, how you spend your money, and how you share your money. And the Bible doesn't condemn money. The Bible condemns the wrong use of money and the wrong love of money. But the Bible certainly does not say it's, money is evil in and of itself. Who made the gold? Who made the silver? Who made the wealth? Well, that was Almighty God. And the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's. The Bible teaches that it is the love of money, the inordinate love of money that is the root of all evil. So let's read this parable here that we're going to read. It's an interesting parable because it kind of goes in a direction that you don't really think. And we're going to just begin here in verse 1. Now, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus says, He also said to his disciples, There's a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be a steward. And what was said to this man one day will be said to me, and it will be said to you. Give an account of your stewardship. Now that word for, that Greek word for stewardship is where we get our, does anybody know where we, uh, what the English word would be? I haven't shown it to you yet in Greek. All right, I'll show it to you in Greek. Does that help? We have an English word. It's where we get our English word economy from. This is oikonomia. It's a plan that involves a set of arrangements. There's a purpose, scheme, plan, or arrangement. And it's used several times here in this passage of Scripture. But it talks about the management of a household or management, and talks about responsibility and tasks. One of these days, I, as a steward of Almighty God, am going to have to give an account for what I've done with that which He has placed in my hands. One day, each of us will have to give an account. One more thing. When you're interpreting a parable, remember that the parable has one major meaning. If you try to find special meaning in every single little detail mentioned in the parable, you can kind of miss the main meaning in this parable. So this parable has one major meaning. See if you can determine what it is as we read it. So we read in verse 3. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I'm ashamed to beg, I've resolved what to do, that when I'm put out of the stewardship, that they may receive me into their houses. So he's come up with a plan, about to lose his job, about to be homeless, he's got a plan. Let's read his plan. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, I owe him 100 measures of oil. So he said, quick, take your bill, sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, 100 measures of wheat. And he said, take your bill and write 80. Hmm. Do you think he was authorized to cut that loan the way he did? I think the answer is no. But take a look at this. This is an interesting response in verse 8. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, 
Who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon's just another word for the God of wealth. This morning, we're going to look from God's perspective about your money and your stewardship. Now, money can be used for good or for evil. In the hands of a Christian, in the hands of a believer, money can be used to provide food for the hungry or shelter for the homeless. Money maybe can be used to purchase clothing for those that are without. Money can be used to send the gospel of Jesus Christ from this place around the world. Part of what we're doing with Operation Christmas Child in those boxes is exactly that. We're using our money to bless others that we'll never meet around the world. Now, Jesus gave a parable to teach us something about the wrong and right use of money. And here's the story. Man was a steward. Now, a steward is somebody who takes care of the wealth of another and handles it for him. So this steward is to be impeccably honest because he's not dealing with what is his own, but he's dealing with that which belongs to someone else. This particular steward wasn't a good steward. He was dishonest. He had failed. He had not managed his Lord's assets very well, and so he's going to lose his job as a steward. And he gets to thinking about his future. He says, I'm not going to dig ditches. I'm not made for work like that. And he says, I can't beg. I'm too ashamed to beg. Now, he wasn't ashamed to steal, as we're going to see in a moment, but he didn't want to be a beggar. He didn't want to be a ditch digger. So he began to think, and he said, what shall I do? I've got to make provision for the future. So he found somebody who owed his Lord 100 measures of oil, and he said, you owe 100 measures. I'll tell you what, if you pay it now, you can pay it off for 50 instead of 100. He found somebody who owed 100 measures of wheat, and he said, I'll tell you what, if you pay it now, you can pay your bill off by just paying 80 measures instead of the full 100. And here's an interesting thing that has caused many people some heartburn as they read this passage of Scripture. Look in verse 8 again. So the master commended the unjust steward. So the boss, he commended the unjust steward. He commended the crook. Now, he doesn't commend his dishonesty. You've missed the point if you think that's what he's saying. He says to him, well, I'll give you credit for one thing. You're acting shrewdly. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. Now, this is worldly wisdom. This is ungodly wisdom, this shrewdness. But he said... You are one shrewd guy. Look what you did. You made provision for your future. And then the Lord said, for the sons of this world, listen to it, for the sons of this world, that is the ungodly, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than sons of light. There's a great lesson here for us. Now, what is that lesson? Here's what the lesson is not. God is not commending dishonesty. So what is he commending here? Here was a steward who is wise to the ways of the world. This steward is aiming steadily at a goal. He's bringing things into a laser focus, and he's saying, I must make provision. He is one who is looking ahead. He's saying, when I don't have a job anymore, I'm going to need some friends, some people who are going to receive me into their house and take care of me, and I've got to get things together. I've got to make plans for the future. And Jesus is saying through this parable, you know, the people of this world do that in their generation. By contrast, the children of light, they fail to bring things into a focus sometimes. And they fail to make plans for the future. And so Jesus said, listen, you do just like the unjust steward. Not in the dishonest part, but if the unjust steward used money to make friends, how much more should you use your money to make friends? To make friends so that when you die, they'll receive you into heavenly habitations. You say, Pastor, I'm not following you. What do you mean, use your money to make friends? Well, you see, all of us are going to die. I think the latest statistic is one out of one of us dies. And when we die, we're not going to stay here. We're going to move on up. We're going to heaven, at least those of us who accepted Christ as our Savior and Lord. And what the Lord is saying is look to the future. Look to the future so that you can have a heavenly homecoming and there'll be a great number of people who'll say to you, thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm here because you were faithful. I'm here because you used your money to make friends out of me. 
And I'm now your friend because you brought me to the Lord Jesus Christ through your love, through your influence, through your prayers, your witness, and your money. And I want to welcome you home. Is that not, again, exactly one of the ways that we're doing that is through Operation Christmas Child? We'll never see where those boxes go. Odds are we will never meet those children in our lifetime. But can you imagine what a homecoming that would be that as you enter heaven, you see all of those kids lined up and said, thank you. It was your gift because of your gift that I came and found the Lord. And I'm here today because of your gift. That's what Jesus is talking about. Don't you want to meet some of the people in heaven that you helped get there? Don't you want those people to say to you, besides the Lord, welcome home, thank you? What a joy, what a privilege it will be to meet you in heaven. Let me give you, and we just talked about the example with Operation Christmas Child. You and I will never meet those kids. And that's what our Lord is saying, at least here, but in heaven we have that hope. And our Lord is saying that you can take it with you if, if, you invest it in the only thing going to heaven, and that is the souls of men and women. That's the only way you can take it with you. I heard about a man who somehow rigged a deal so that he could take a suitcase full of gold to heaven. And so when he got to heaven, he had this suitcase full of gold, and the angel who was checking him into heaven said, what's that in your hand? He said, well, you know, I got this suitcase full of gold. They said I, could, I couldn't take it with me, but I got it right here. And the angel said, well, that's kind of strange. Come on in. I, I don't know what we're going to do with the extra pavement, but just come on in. You know, the streets of gold are made of, or streets of heaven are made of gold. Folks, listen, what you think is important down here is not going to be important up there. And what's going to be important up there are the souls of men and women. So we're going to look a little bit into what the Bible has to say about wealth today. Now listen very carefully. I want us to be thinking about what God has put into our hands. And God is interested in our assessment of wealth, what we think about it. God's interested in our attainment of wealth, how we get it. And God's interested in our assignment of wealth, what we're going to do with it. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, over and over and over again in the Bible, we see God dealing with matters of our finances and our resources. In fact, of the 38 parables that Jesus taught and that are recorded in the scriptures, 16 of them deal with stewardship. One out of every 10 verses in the New Testament deal with this matter of stewardship. You take the verses in the New Testament that deal with faith, there are about 500 of them. You take all the verses in the New Testament about prayer, there are about 500 of them. You take the verses that deal with stewardship and there are over 2,000 of them. God is interested in our stewardship how we acquire, and how we use money. As a matter of fact, when the great test of your spirituality and how much you love God and how much you believe the Word of God is stewardship. You can measure a man's faith, a man's character, a man's religion by his attitude towards money. For this realm of stewardship is not only the way that men make money, but it's also the way that God makes men. God's not in the business of raising money. God's in the business of growing men. And I've observed that often more people are ruined by prosperity than they are by adversity. Now, I want you to think about these three thoughts today, and I want you to apply them not to the person sitting next to you, but I want you to apply them to your own heart. Whether you're young or old, rich or poor, working or non-working, here's some things I want you to apply to yourself, and then you're going to have some practical homework at the very end of the service. So number one, we need a proper assessment of our wealth. Look, if you will, in verse 13. Jesus sums it all up, this parable, by, by saying this, no, one, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Let's just put it in plain English. You can't serve God and money. You can't serve both. Either you'll serve money or you'll serve God, but you cannot serve both. That's what verse 13 says. So let's unpack this a little bit and apply it to our lives. We'll do that by asking a few questions and see if we really serve God or if we're serving money. So let's look at the trust test. You see, whatever a man trusts in, that's his God, isn't it? Now, if you're trusting in money, you're trusting in uncertain riches, then money's your God. Now, do you find yourself constantly visualizing what you could do if you had enough money? You know, there's some things that money can do, but there's a lot of things that money can't do. 
For example, Proverbs 11 and verse 4, we read that riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. That is, when the ju final judgment comes and the wrath of God descends, you're not going to be able to buy your way out. Riches don't profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from wrath. When your soul stands before Almighty God, you're going to find out that if you put your trust in money, you put your trust in the wrong thing. How about Proverbs 11 and verse 28? He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. Now, if money is your God, if that's where your trust is, you're going down. That's the trust test. And here's another one. How about a priority test? What are your goals in life? Is your goal to have a lot of money? Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to have a lot of money. I ask, is your goal in life to have a lot of money? The Bible says, but those that desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Are you thinking about the house that you could buy or the car that you could buy? Are you thinking about how much you can put away? Are you consumed with that? Or, on the other hand, are you concerned with the character of your children? Are you consumed with growing in Christ? Are you consumed with your prayer life? Are you consumed with telling others about Christ? Are you consumed with the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you be willing to take a reduction in salary in order to have a better environment to raise your children and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? Or would you believe that making more money is the most important element needed to raise your children, even if it meant that you couldn't be as involved in the spiritual raising of your children in church and in home? What's the, what's the priority? Is your goal to have enough to impress other people, to satisfy in your, own, your own pride or to gain power? Then money is your God. And Jesus reminds us in Matthew 6, verse 33, that seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness all these other things will be added to you. Do you think that if you have enough money, you'd be secure? That's the trust test. Is making money the number one priority in your life? That's the priority test. Here's another one, the surrender test. Here's how this one goes. Is there anything you own? Listen carefully now. Is there anything you own, anything, that you would not glad, gladly surrender to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ? Is there anything you own that you wouldn't gladly surrender to the Lord Jesus. And I didn't say that you'd give it if the pastor asked for it. And I didn't say that you'd give it if somebody could twist your arm really good. I'm not asking about that. I'm asking that if you knew in your heart that God wanted it, and you knew it would glorify the Lord, and I don't care what it is, would you say, Lord, it's yours? I'm only a steward. All you've asked for is what is yours already? If you can't say that, you're trusting in mammon rather than almighty God. And here's another test, the admiration test. What things do you really admire? Had you rather spend time studying the market so that you can make a better return? Or had you rather be reading the Bible? Had you rather be reading Forbes or Wall Street Journal or Fortune magazine? Or had you rather be reading God's Word? And I'm not saying it's wrong to read those things or to study those things. I'm asking, where is your joy? If you had a chance to be invited a home to a meal with a rich and powerful and influential group of people, or with the dedicated and sincere and godly, to which home would you rather go? What do you really admire? What do you think is the most important thing in this life? Now, it's, if you are to be a good steward, you're going to have to have a proper assessment of wealth. See it for what it is. Don't worship wealth. Put the Lord first. That doesn't mean he doesn't want you to have things. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Now, first, there must be a proper assessment. Don't make money your God. Second, because you have a proper assessment of your wealth, there must be a proper attainment of your wealth. God encourages honest work. God's not only interested in how you see your money, but God is interested in how you obtain your money. Now, this parable teaches us that God encourages honest work. We're stewards. Verse 2 tells us that we are stewards, and so God is interested in the investment of and the handling of and the making of money. You see, stewardship is that area of life where men make money, God makes men, where women make money, and God makes women. He uses your wealth and money and the way you go at it into making you and your character. 
It's God's way of testing us and trying to prepare us for things that are far more important. You see, if you've not been faithful in the small things and in the monetary things, who's going to give you the true riches? Look, if you will, again in verses 10 through 12 of Luke 16. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Now, what does this mean? Well, God rewards faithfulness. This parable teaches us that the measure of how much God can trust you with spiritual power in things that really matter is how you deal with your money. The measure of how much God can trust you with spiritual power and influence is how you deal with money. What you do with your money is an index of what you will have in greater treasure. God is withholding blessings from some this morning here in this congregation and watching online. God's withholding blessings from you, and I'll tell you why. God gave you a test, and you failed that test. God gave you some possessions that came from God, and God wanted to see what you were going to do with those possessions. And you were not faithful to God with those possessions. You failed the test, and God could not give you what he really wanted to give you. Look at verse 11 again. It says, therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you to your trust the true riches? Why should God commit greater things to your stewardship if you've not been faithful in these lesser things? If you can't take care of the mundane and the material things, who's going to commit to you the spiritual things, the great things, the true riches? If you're not faithful in small things, who's going to give you the big things? Now, the Bible says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. It doesn't say he could be. It says he is. It follows as night follows day. Everything big is made up of something little. And if you take care of the little things, the big ones are there. And it's impossible for you to be faithful in little things and not be faithful in big things. And so everything big is made up of something little. And so our Lord just tests us. He entrusts us. And he gives us a test to see if we can handle what he's given us. Now, some of you may be very wealthy materially, but very poor spiritually. Because God has given you wealth to see what you would do with it. And you've failed the test. And you'll never, no, never, no, never know true riches. Now, the Bible doesn't say you can't have both. You can there's Abraham, and there's David, and there's Joseph of Arimathea. And there are just few of the many people in the Bible who had both material and spiritual riches. Some of the godliest people you'll ever meet on the face of this earth are people who have learned to be good stewards of that which God has put in their hands. So God is interested in your stewardship. Stewardship is how men make and manage money. Did you know that God takes pleasure when you prosper? Psalms 35 and verse 27 says this, Let them shout with joy and be glad, who favor my righteous cause, and let them, continually, let them say continually, Let the Lord be magnified, who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. God wants to bless you. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who wants to be is going to be wealthy. If you can handle it, God wants to take pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Did you know that you can either be blessed or cursed with riches? Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18 tells us this, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. But folks, if that is your consuming desire, if that is your goal in life, you're headed down and you're going to get yourself into serious trouble because the Bible says this in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Look what it's caused. It is caused for which some have what? They have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Don't ever tell anybody that it's all right to make all the money you can just as long as you make it honestly. That's a lie out of hell. If you're making all the money you can, you're going to be making money when you ought to be praying, or when you ought to be soul winning, or when you ought to be spending time with the kids, or when you ought to be sleeping. Not only can you wander from the faith, an obsession with riches can cost you your health as well. Read in Psalms 127 and verse 2, It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for see, so he gives his beloved sleep. A wise man said, Many people spend the first half of their life wasting their health, 
to get their wealth and then spend the last half of their life spending their wealth to try to get their health back. And they're unhappy at both ends of their lives. Folks, it's one thing for you to possess wealth. It's a completely different thing if wealth possesses you. Here's another part of the proper attainment of wealth. God expects honest handling of money. Don't make money in any manner that is contrary to the will of God. Proverbs 16 and verse 11 tells us this, Honest weights and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. If you're in any unfair trade practice, if you think of yourself as a shrewd wheeler dealer, God will hold you accountable for that. How about gambling? You say, Pastor, you're meddling now. So what if I like to play the lottery? What's wrong with gambling? Money made by gambling has the curse of God on it. Gambling has the spirit of a thief. You're trying to get what belongs to another person into your own hands without giving him or her anything for it. You're paying for the chance to take from someone else. Stealing is taking from others. It's a pleasure and profit at somebody else's pain and loss. All legitimate business is win-win. Gambling is win-lose. There cannot be winners without losers. It's completely, totally antithetical to basic morality in or out of the Bible. We'll pick another one of our favorites. How about liquor? You have no business being in the liquor business. That business is brewed with tears, thickened with blood, and flavored with death. And the Bible says in Habakkuk 2 verse 15, Woe to him, woe who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk. Do you know that it's estimated that up to 35% of all global web traffic is related to pornography? Porn sites receive more website traffic in the U.S. than Twitter, which is now Z, Instagram, TikTok, Netflix, Pinterest, and Zoom combined. Folks, it has the curse of Almighty God upon it. Don't try to make money by these things. You say, well, a man's got to live. No, a man's got to die, and he's got to face God, and God is interested in the way you make money. Now, if you're in an honorable profession, however, and you have a good job and a decent job and a fair job, whatever you do, do it with all of your might. Don't be afraid of hard work. My father was one of the hardest working men that I've ever known. He belonged in the bygone era of a man's word was his bond and his handshake was more binding than a contract. My dad didn't leave me a legacy of money. That doesn't bother me one bit. He left me a legacy of character. He taught me the importance of hard work. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Plain English translation is be honest, work hard, God will honor that. Here's another part of the proper attainment of wealth. God expects us to be prudent with our money. Most people today don't know how to save money. Do you know that one of the most common reasons I have found for a couple to come and ask the pastor for marriage counseling is because of money? One's a spender, the other's a saver, and it causes strife in the household. Do you and your wife or you and your husband ever argue about money? Someone once wrote this in a line of poetry. Theirs was a perfect marriage, but for one feminine flaw. He was quick on the deposit, but she was quicker on the draw. So many Americans today, by the way, it works both ways. Sometimes it's men that are the spenders and the women that are the savers. But so many Americans today are up to here with debt. Somebody has described the average American as a person who drives a bank financed car over a bond financed highway with gasoline he bought with a credit card. He's on his way to open a charge account in a department store so he can fill his house that he owes the bank for with installment purchased furniture. That's an American for you. We're buying things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. 
That's Americans for you. We're in financial bondage, so many of us. You say, well, I'm not in financial bondage. I've got plenty. I've got it salted away. I've got it stacked in a bank account somewhere. Man, if you could just see what I've got. Or you may have plenty and still be in financial bondage. Rich people are in financial bondage when they try to find satisfaction in their money and they can't do it. The Bible says this, he who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver and he who, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. Someone asked J.D. Rockefeller, how much was enough? His response, just a little more. And by the way, the Bible teaches that we're not to hoard money. We read in James chapter 5, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and you will eat, it will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Now notice that word treasure in verse 3. It's where we get our English word thesaurus, which is a collection. And that's what it means. It means to store up, to gather, to amass. And this word treasure has the idea of a collection. You just have this spirit of hoarding. And the Bible's against hoarding. Now you say, what's the difference between saving and hoarding? Hoarding is where you have more than you'll ever need, and for you, making money's a game. And the person who wins the prize has the biggest ego. Some people are addicted to making money like some are addicted to drugs. You see, in hoarding, the person wants a surplus. In saving, the person wants to meet a need. In saving, you anticipate the future and future needs, and you prepare for it. And the Bible teaches that we are to save money. We're to plan for the future. Listen to these verses, Proverbs 6 and verse 6. It says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Now, the ant doesn't have any, somebody to yell at them and say, Lay up for yourself food for the winter time. They just do that. Proverbs 21 and verse 20. There's desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man squanders it. I like how one pastor put it. If you only make $20 a week and you save a nickel of it, you're a success. But if you spend a nickel more than you make, you're a failure. We're to save. The Bible doesn't teach that you're to hoard. God wants his money in circulation. The Bible teaches that you are to save and to find out what your anticipated needs are and to prepare for it. One of these days you're going to die and your epitaph may be the richest fool in the cemetery because you had something you could have used for the glory of God. You could have made friends that would bring you into heavenly habitations, but you didn't do it. Larry Burkett used to do finances before he went home to be with the Lord. He said that the average American is worth less at 65 than he is at 25. He hasn't learned how to save. And you see, we need to have a proper attainment of money. Now, here's the third thing. Not only do you need to have, have a proper assessment of money and a proper attainment of money, you need to have a proper assignment of money. For this, we need the proper attitude. God's interested in how you see money and how you get money and how you use money. Do you know, if I want to find out a lot about your character, I could just look at your bank book. I'll find out a lot about you. And you'd find out a lot about me. Many marriages, and some are listening to me, you're in trouble over money more than any other difficulty. You've not learned to manage your money. You say, if I get a raise, that'll take care of me. No, it won't. The problem's an attitude problem. To whom little is not enough, nothing is enough. And if you cannot be faithful in that which is least, you'll not be faithful in that which is much. And as a matter of fact, some people, when they get a raise or a bigger job or promotion, it just opens the door to wider indebtedness. Now, this next part will be extremely important and practical. So if you need help in any of these areas, these are resources that you have at your disposal, at your hand. How about debt? A couple practical guidelines for this. I told you it's going to be very practical and there's going to be some homework. Only use credit cards if you know you can pay them off at the end of the month. If you don't have the discipline to do that, don't use them. Statistics show us that people who buy with credit cards spend more money than they would have if they had bought with cash because it doesn't seem like you're spending your money, or at least at the moment. You say, Pastor, I'm already in debt. How can I get out of debt? Well, number one, don't borrow any more money. 
You can't get out of debt by borrowing money any more than you can put out a fire with gasoline. Number two, designate everything possible to debt retirement except your necessities, except your tithe to Almighty God. Never stop tithing in order to get out of debt because you need God's help to get out of debt. And learn to tithe. When we got married, we said we'd be faithful to God in the tithe. And we said that we'll not only tithe, we'll give an offering, which is more than a tithe. And we've done that our entire married life. And folks, I shared with you a couple months ago when I talked about giving. There were times that we hardly had two nickels that we could rub together. But all these years, we were faithful to the Lord in the tithe. And he never failed us once. The Bible says in Malachi 3, verse 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I can give you that testimony. That's the kind of God we serve. You don't tithe because it pays. You tithe because it's the right thing to do. When you've given a tithe, that doesn't mean the other nine-tenths is yours. All that you have belongs to God. The tithe is only an indication. It's only a representation that, Lord, here's the tenth. It's yours already, and the rest of it, Lord, you, is, to use, to use, is yours to use however you want. Three, sell off those things that are costing you money, those depreciating items. Maybe you've got a newer car, and that payment is a pretty big chunk of what goes out every month. Well, you might need to sell it and take a loss and get a car that just gets you from point A to point B. I drive one of those. It's a 23-year-old vehicle but it gets me to point A to point B. Kind of fun, too. Make all sorts of noises and things happen that I don't know, and I get to ask Jason. I said, Jason, what's this mean and what that means? So pay yourself rather than paying other people. You can do some things. Cut your own grass, do your own cooking, clean your own house. Beware of impulse buying. Buy according to your need, not according to your greed. And build a budget. Do you know what a budget is? Proverbs 27, verses 23 and 24 says this, Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. For riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. A budget is a system of telling your dollars where to go instead of looking around and asking where they went. Does that make sense? That's what it means. That's what I mean when to have a budget. And get on this budget. We did, Pastor Steve last fall did a money management class. It was a financial class with Ron Blue and his materials. Pastor Steve taught it. It was outstanding. We got this class because when Jared was attending Charleston Southern, he took an entire class, and that was the textbook. And so we will offer that periodically at the church, so sign up for it. Plan. You need to have a plan. Plan with a budget is for the here and now. But you need to plan for the future. That was what Luke 16, that parable, was all about. Proverbs 13, verse 22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Now, this might surprise you. Do you know one of the best professions to be in if you want to retire a millionaire? Somebody said something I can't hear. Undertaker. Undertaker. That's not on the list, and I wouldn't have thought of that either. So that's very good, though. I would have never thought that one. <laughs> yeah, you always got work. That's true. But Dave Ramsey did research with over 10,000 millionaires in the United States, and he said, how'd they make their money, and where did they come from? How many would think, like, being a doctor, a physician, or being a lawyer, that's the way? You're going to be surprised at this one. Being a teacher. Top five careers, teacher was number three. I know everybody's saying, no way. Have you seen what my paycheck is? How did it happen? How is this so? Through careful planning. And if they can do it, you can learn to steward God's resources and watch him multiply in ways that only he can do. How about life insurance? Only 46% of Americans have no life insurance. So a little more than half do, a little less than half don't. But half of the half that say they do are underinsured. How about wills? 
we love to talk about this stuff, don't we? Because we're always thinking about dying and how we're going to die. We all, are you like me that you like to kick that can down the curb? Like, yeah, I know I need to do it. I need to look at the life insurance, but I can do it later. And I need to look at my will, but I can do it later. Like maybe when I'm 90 or so, I might need to think about it. Anybody feel like that? 56% of Americans believe that estate planning is important but only 33% of adults in the U.S. have documented their end-of-life plans. That means two-thirds of you, if you're consistent with the group, two-thirds of you do not have any will or you don't have it all completed. Of the estate plans made in 2021, 75% were wills, 18% were trusts, and 6% of people nominated a guardian for their young children. Now, have you considered all of that? Do you have a durable power of attorney? These are all the things I hadn't thought about. I thought just making a will was all I needed. There's a whole lot more because there's a whole lot of contingencies that can happen. The South Carolina Baptist Convention offers a ministry to all of their churches and the members of those churches, and that has to do with estate planning. And I've asked Jackie Winger from the Baptist Foundation to come up and I just want her to share a moment I want to introduce her to you uh, she was here last year but I want to introduce you would you all welcome her she comes up would you just share with us a little bit about the uh, Baptist Foundation and what you all do for churches and members of churches good morning it's already been a form fun morning I was over in the Hispanic um, um, service just for a moment and I told told them that I'm a little stiff you know I love going to to um, Hispanic services because they, they get a little excitable. Um, I am with the Baptist Foundation of South Carolina. We're part of the South Carolina Baptist Convention, which is 2,200 churches in the state of South Carolina. We're Southern Baptists, and part of that is the foundation that has been around since 1950. And one of the, our areas of ministry is in legacy planning because in America, as Pastor Sean just shared, about 60% of Americans have not planned for their future. You know, I paid my bills last night. I still balance my checkbook. I think about money a lot. Yeah, we, we do. We think about what we have and, and where it's going and, and all of those things. And those are things that, that we work on and, and save and, and all of the things that we've just heard. And that was great, Pastor Sean. Um, but, but one of the things that we do not think about is the day that we pass away and that we will be 100% generous. We'll be 100% generous to our family or 100% generous somewhere. But we don't want to talk about it and we don't want to think about it. And so what happens many times is because we want to wait until we're 90 because we're all going to live to 115, right? Um, we, we don't think about it, and then there's a day of confusion. That's a day that we need to be thinking about and praying about. I know a lot of us pray about finances and what we're going to do today, but if you prayed about what is going to happen with how God blessed me, and if you asked, you know, God, why did you put me here in the United States of America, one of the richest countries in the world, at one of the richest time in history. Did you know that in the next 30 years, approximately $68 trillion is going to be passed through our states? Because most of what you have, you don't live on. I wrote my bills because I receive a paycheck, and that's what I live on. But I'm putting money over here in a retirement fund because I'm, I'm planning for my future. And of course, the, all the TV shows tell us it should be a lot. And a lot of people have amassed a lot in their retirement funds that really aren't supposed to, to ever go out. And I have a home, and I have these other things, and I even have personal things that are important to me, like this necklace that I always wear that you can't see, but was the last thing that my mom gave to me when she died 30 years ago. It's a cross, it's important. So as we go through life, we think about the day, today, 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 but we don't think about tomorrow. And I'm going to ask this. Of all that that we've amassed, have we ever considered God? You know, I, I think about today and, and what I'm going to tithe 
but I, do I think about the next generation? That maybe you blessed me and put me here today in a generation where there is so much wealth that maybe I have an opportunity to pour into a future generation, those that have not yet heard about Jesus. And so one of the things that we do at the Baptist Foundation is we serve families by helping them plan for a time in, in, in the life of a family that's, that even though we know that family member has gone to be with the Lord, those that left behind have a lot of things they have to do. And the laws of this state say these are the things that have to be done. And if you haven't made provision and preparation for that, then it's not going to go exactly how you might think. So one of the things that we do is we provide a way for people to go through a planning process that's very personal and confidential. They don't sell you anything. It's not, you don't even have to use the Baptist Foundation, but that's something that we offer to you as, as South Carolina Baptists because in all of America, and there's one and a half million charities in the United States, only 8% of, of, of estate plans include any charity. You know why? Well, 60% of people don't have plans. So the state just says, hey, it's gonna be this way and we're gonna decide how your money's gonna be doled out and it'll go to your family or the closest family members. But people have not taken the time to plan. God has given you this life at this time for a purpose. God has given us our witches and wealth for a purpose. But if we th th thought about how we can use what we have today. Have you considered tithing your estate? Have you considered other things? How can we bless this church? How can we bless this school for the future? Those are the things that we, we offer and provide for you. So Pastor Sean will tell you a little bit more about that. Jackie, thank you so much. So she came here um, last November and she presented in Sunday evening service and one of us decided to go ahead and said, well, we need to kind of do our estate planning. That was Deborah and me. We decided we'd put it off long enough. And besides, I didn't want to commend something to you until I had gone through it myself so I could tell you all the ins and outs and where the, the catches are. Here's what we found. It was very um, confidential. Once we made contact with Jackie's office, they referred us to a corporation, a company out in Colorado. We had six meetings by phone, about once a month. The pace was perfect. And there, they just simply asked us questions, the questions we needed to ask. Some of the questions we didn't know to ask until they asked. And so each time we would come and we would pray and put together, we'd make progress after the first meeting. And then we'd have the second meeting, be some more things to work on. We would pray and then... And we'd come to a third meeting, and then we would pray. Eventually, we got down what we believe the Lord would have us do. Now, most of you here own a home. We don't. We don't have a lot of assets. So there was a part of me that said, I don't know what I really have to leave behind. And it's important to me, like it is to you, to take care of your family. But I always wanted to leave something as a legacy for the Lord that would live beyond me. Working with them and praying through, I found a way to not only take care of Deborah and Jared, and then when Deborah and I are both gone, Jared, we can take care of our family. But we can also take care of, we have a chance to sow into a legacy. And we chose to do with a, a South Carolina ministry, a Baptist ministry. The one that's nearest and dearest to our hearts is Oakwood Baptist Church. And I don't mind telling you that that's what we made provision for. And so, you ask, what was the cost? Where were the hidden fees? There was none. All the counseling, all that was free, all the time we took. We did pay for an attorney here locally that they'd already contracted and pre-negotiated the rate, which was an incredible price. It was a bargain price. To put together what we have is a, gives us a copy of our estate documents. It has every contingency planned. If, if I become incapacitated, there are things already in place. That gives me great comfort and peace of mind, knowing that if anything happens to me, or God forbid happens to Deborah, or God forbid happens to both of us at the same time, we have all the steps in place. 
and put in place and how to do that. And that's important. I can tell you as a pastor, I deal with death. Do a lot of funerals. And you'd be, if I could tell you over and over again how many times people thought they had everything in place and they didn't. If you think you have all your paperwork in place, just want them to review it. They'll be happy to look at it. So I commend that to you, and that's something I feel that we can do as a church family that our convention, our denomination offers for us, and I certainly wanted you to know about it because I think it would help you personally, not only taking care of your family, but the opportunity to leave that legacy behind. Now, it's easy to put things off. I know this. We put this off way too long. By the way, Al and Nancy have also gone through this. They went through about two years prior, so there's two of us in the church congregation that I know of that did that. In a word, how was the experience? Easy? A relief. We talked about that too. We finally have all that done, and this can be done. So Jackie's going to be here. She's going to join us for lunch. She's going to be right out there, and she'll have a table. You can fill out a card, and she'll get your, just your contact information, and you can start the process. If you have any questions for her, she'll be here with us. She's going to join us for lunch. And if you have any questions for her, you can do that. So my encouragement is don't put things off this morning. It's, don't be on the side where you're going to say one day, I wish I had, rather than I'm glad I did. God wants to bless us. And again, this is what God says. If you haven't been faithful in what and that which is least, you won't be faithful in that which is much. And if you've not been faithful in that which is another's, who's going to commit into your hands true riches? You can take it with you if you'll learn to be faithful. Let me pray for you all this, this morning. Lord, we've talked, it's a little bit of a different sermon this morning, where we've talked about preparing for the future in a very practical way, way that, that would honor you, Lord, because we've taken care of our family and we have taken, even been able to leave, in our case, something behind that can be used for your honor and glory after we leave. Lord, I pray that you would give us the heart to be forward thinking. Lord, this church is a loving church. Even this morning as I was doing the new members class, I heard the testimony of just how so many people went up and introduced themselves to someone when they were their first time visiting. And Lord, this church has been willing to step out on faith time and again. It is a church that loves you and seeks to see what you can do in our midst. And Lord, there's a whole lot of faith that comes into that, but there's some practical common sense that comes in too, and this is an area of preparation. Help us to leave that inheritance to our children's children, not just a physical legacy, but a spiritual legacy as well. Lord, we exist here for those who don't yet know Christ. Help us to be here 5 and 10 and 20 and 50 and 100 years, should you tarry, so that this church can still be a light to its community and beyond. Lord, if there's anyone here that's here this morning or maybe watching online, they've watched all through this, and they realize that they haven't made the most important plans, and that's how to secure their own soul for eternity, how they know they'll go to heaven. Lord, I pray that this morning would be the day that they would act, accept Jesus into their heart and into their life, ask forgiveness for their sins of, from Jesus, and ask him to be their Savior and Lord. Lord, I thank you that we're here for the main thing, to see that others come to Jesus. So help us to put what you've put in our hands, help us to use all of that, our talents, our time, our treasure, into that one laser focus, seeing that others come to know Jesus as their Savior too. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a prayer need and you're online, would you please email us? It would be our privilege to pray with you. If you're here and you have a prayer need, it would be my privilege to pray with you now. If you'll stand and we'll sing. If you have a prayer need, I'll be down front to pray with you. Ms. Kay?
Archie, you want to give us an update on Elizabeth? Please remember to continue praying for Joyce. She's been on a long haul with, this is coming up on what, almost three months now, Ginger? Yeah. And then William, here's another, um, you wouldn't even know, he's, he's had how many weeks of radiation treatment? Anybody know now? William Hentz? It's like at least three. Yeah, so he's done three or four. William Hentz. William Joyner is another one. But William Henson, I was thinking about William Joyner also is another walking miracle. So we got two Williams. Yeah, William Joyner's got surgery, so remember that. William Hentz, um, you wouldn't have known. He was here yesterday setting up all the tables and chairs. You wouldn't know he was having radiation treatments. And when you see him, he's telling me about how God's using him to minister to other gentlemen who are going through the same treatment. And they're hesitant, and he's just sitting there just sharing with them and encouraging them through the process. So... You are an amazing group of people, but please, please continue to pray for these needs. I'll take a moment right now to do that. Um, you have plenty of time. I understand they were the fish got started cooking a little bit late, but I'm pretty sure they've got plenty already. So you've got plenty of time to talk to Jackie right afterwards, get some information, then come on and join us. Even if you didn't plan, well, you just make plans now. Forget about where you're going to lunch. Just join us for lunch. You've got fish fry, all the fixings with it over there. And... I heard the most important part in the dessert was the, what's that called again? The churros. So we have, was it fish fry and churros? So I'm going to see how that goes. You got to tell me how that goes together. Lord, thank you for our time together. And we do pray for William and William and Joyce and Elizabeth. Thank you for the work that you're doing in their lives and the grace that they've experienced thus far. And, Lord, they each have a journey ahead of them. But, Lord, they're not alone. You're with them. And even more, we can join with them. Thank you for the outpouring of love from this congregation. Would you continue to work in each of those situations for them and their loved ones, the caregivers who are taking care of them. May they experience your strength and grace during this time. Lord, thank you for this opportunity we have to fellowship together. I pray that you would bless the food. Thank you for all of those. We had a crew over there working. Thank you for their hard work. Would you bless the food and our time of fellowship? And Lord, I thank you. The most important thing is having a love relationship with you, Jesus. But there's so many ways in our life that we can order our life. And you tell us in the Bible, it's so practical. Thank you for these practical parts of stewardship that you've taught us in your word. Thank you for the tools that people like Jackie have to give us to be able to help to order things, order our lives well. And Lord, we, these things are important, but they're only important as we put them in focus and in the priority that people need the Lord. So help us with every ounce of our being to be dedicated to that commission, that great commission, to see those that don't know Jesus come to know him. Thank you for these folks. Would you bless them and watch over us and bless our time of fellowship together. In Jesus' name, amen. Make us one, Lord. Make us one.